uh, we have with us uh, Joe Vack, Vack from from the uh, Wilmer Hall, uh, Wilmer Hall uh, company, basically based in Power Alto, and uh, we'll be basically talking about the role uh, law firms basically play in the startup journey and how he had he'll advise uh, of how these uh, early entrepreneurs should actually consider things that they should consider about the investors as well as the um, you know entrepreneurs. So. Uh, so BPEP, so before we get into the talk, I'll just have to quickly give you a brief about what BPEP is. So BPEP stands for Berkeley Entrepreneur, the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneur Program. And basically we kind of have, uh, so Narish uh, was a few person and I joined in late, late uh, like a few years ago in this program. And basically we'd like to bring, uh, you know, these postdocs are based at uh, UCB as well as LBL and get make them you know uh, get get them in touch with the uh, the startups around the Bay Area. So we basically foster, translate, energize, and build uh, the community of entrepreneurs and uh, and postdocs from the Bay Area. And um, so basically, we are a, a group of five individuals. Uh, we have Harish, uh, Ajay Harish, basically from UCB, who is a postdoc there, and Srinidhi which is Sri, which is me, and I'm a postdoc at LBL. Uh, Tadisi is a uh, UC president's uh, postdoc, and uh, Alex, Alex from joining us from Brazil is a is a professor in the in, uh, in the university, and Naresh, of course, uh, he's our mentor at BPEP. Um, so today we have Joe uh, from Wilmer Hell uh, uh, Company firm, which is based in Pau Alto, and uh, he's going to give us, uh, 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 as I said, he's going to go about the uh, legal aspects of how to start a start a uh, startup company. Um, before I hand over the stage to him, I'd like to go through, I'd like to basically extend the thanks to our supporters uh, at, at UCB. So we'd like to thank the uh, Berkeley Research, Skydeck, VSPA for their support. And uh, these, uh, so we also engaged in, so these are our, uh, basically our social media links. So if you would like, if you are interested in learning about what VPEP does and the events which come through, you can get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And um, we also have, uh, so I mean, like we basically, Looking for postdocs uh, in, in in the UCB or in, around the uh, the University of California campuses as well as Berkeley Lab to join our uh, team. So basically, you get like good exposure and good professionals around the Bay Area and kind of put in your pitch in your ideas for a startup. So, and um, we also have uh, we also conduct like uh, workshops uh, throughout the year, which basically help in help the postdocs in pitching their ideas, kind of writing up a uh, you know a hands on help with whatever with the pitch they have. Also, we help them in grant writing, uh, which could actually help or help their career. Um, and also we get the, uh, we get basically, we introduce them to the, uh, to the startup founders in the Bay Area and get going. And uh, so we are also looking for, I mean, we basically also have like a portal where we have different uh, free, uh, job vacancies which are posted by the companies around the Bay Area. So please feel free to go to BPEP jobs portal and you'll have a list of these companies and the vacancies. Um, also, we have this uh, science fellow program, which basically helps these post elf postdocs or grads to work with companies uh, on for a three to six, three to six months uh, period. And then you, you, it is basically involves a lot of uh, good experience, which you can actually get through those things and eventually uh, get into the company or you know improve your experience. Uh, we also have the startup scholarship, which we are actually announced, which basically is a, a QB3 startup where we are giving five hundred dollars to uh, uh, to basically help get access to resources which are needed for your for building a start startup right and uh, i mean so basically we also looking for uh, we also looking for people who can join BPEP and be a part of it and on, on the exec team so if you are if you like what the work which you are doing please feel free to contact us and uh, you know kind of put in your application to be a part of the BPEP a family yeah we like to also thank our advisory board for, of BPEP for their excellent support and all for your for for their motivation so without further ado i'll uh, hand over the stage to uh, Joe, and uh, he'll take it on from here. Thank you so much, uh, Joe, for joining us today. Happy to do it. Thank you, Sri. Yeah. So like Sri said, my name is Joe Wyatt. I'm a partner um, in my firm's uh, emerging company group. I've been representing startup companies for about 22 years. Uh, I'm a Cal alum. Um, I work with a lot of um, programs up at Cal, such as the Launch Program, uh, Citrus Foundry, Skydeck, and others. And so I really enjoy uh, supporting the Berkeley ecosystem. So thanks again for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these slides, um, but if people have questions, um, especially if we're doing it on Zoom, please just interrupt me, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. In my experience, if one person has a question, um, probably three more have the same question, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. If you um, are shy or think of something after the presentation, my contact information um, is on this presentation, but Shri and Naresh have it as well, so you can feel free to reach out to me. So with that, let's get started. You can always type the questions in the chat. If you're too shy, please do that. 
All right. So whenever we start a company, in addition to kind of the business um, rationale for starting the company, working with the founders um, and, and working on the business side, because one thing I do enjoy about representing startup companies is it's not just legal work. You get to actually advise them um, sometimes on business issues. What I really enjoy is learning about the technology. But from the pure legal side, there's certain things that we do as lawyers to make sure that the company is properly organized um, and capitalized with a view to doing, um, at least initially, a financing, um, getting funded, and then secondarily, um, but related, uh, is the exit event, whether it be a sale of the company um, or an IPO, okay? So in connection with those types of events, like a financing event or an exit event, um, investors and buyers and underwriters will do extensive due diligence. In addition, venture capital investors have a particular view as to how most companies should be organized. And I don't mean that by, you know, one, one founder should get X percent and another founder should get Y percent, but they have a certain expectation of how a company's document, corporate documentation will look um, and, and what it'll cover, okay? In my experience, the two most critical points that investors or buyers or underwriters look at from a legal perspective is IP ownership and the company's capitalization. And what that means is, you know, who owns what number of shares in the company, who owns or has options in the company, so on and so forth. And so it's really critical from the get-go that your corporate documentation be correct, accurate, and, and for lack of a better term, look like the documentation that the investor's council, a buyer's council, or underwriter's council will be used used to reviewing. Because at the end of the day, as a company counsel, what you want them to do is just check the box and move on and not raise a bunch of due diligence issues. So what I tell my clients is it's never too early to prepare. And what I mean by that is our law firm and frankly, most of the law firms um, in the Valley have programs for startup companies where we defer fees. Um, we give actually some free services um, and other things to be able to represent companies from inception you know, four founders come in, want to start a company, we can, we can assist them with that and be their general outside corporate counsel, um, you know, on all matters going forward. So um, what that means to you guys is you should find a lawyer from inception. If you're thinking about starting a company and you have founders and you, you think you have a project or a product that is something that would be, you could build a company around is fundable, um, you should go see a lawyer from the get-go. And the reason I say that is it's much easier to do things correct from the beginning than trying to clean it up on the back end, okay? So you wanna build a company to avoid financing and exit roadblocks, avoid mistakes, get good advisors, um, establish sound corporate governance and other processes. That one's critical. Um, you should go to your outside counsel if you're planning on granting options. If you're planning on bringing on another founder, if you're planning on in licensing or out licensing technology, um, and you need to document everything. When you go to do a financing, and I'll, and I'll focus mostly on the financing for purposes of this the, this discussion, because that will be the first real event in which your company will be um, uh, due diligence. Okay, and so you just want to make sure you have the proper documentation, everything's buttoned up, um, and again, it's better and cheaper to do things on the front end correctly than trying to clean it up on the back end. And any, an experienced startup company attorney can help you with all this. I'm gonna talk about some best practices. And, and again, your, your counsel can assist you with this, but I, I focus a little bit on these best practices because the flip, flip side is these categories are things where I see most founders make mistakes, okay? And so um, it's, again, best to do things correctly from the beginning. So Capitalization best practices. So basically what I mean by capitalization is you're issuing shares in the company and you're going to be the owners of the company. Um, and over time, as you take an investment, you'll be diluted, but you'll continue to be owners of the company. So the first item is don't make oral promises for equity. I find in a lot of instances um, where founders could get together, they're just talking um, um, about um, you know, who will get what in the company. And then one founder leaves or you decide, frankly, that one founder uh, or potential founder isn't a good fit for the company. And there is an, uh, an oral promise or an email that says, hey, you're going to get 15% of the company. So you really want to just have a, a discussion, but not make promises. Um, 
established ownership percentages early in the process. And what I mean by that is if you have four founders and you decide, and this is not necessarily advisable, but for purposes of this discussion, if you decide four founders, each person should get 25% each, you know, nail that down from inception. Don't decide, you know, after you've incorporated the company, you've issued all the shares that no, you know, founder number one should really get 35% and, um, and uh, you know, founder number two should get 15%. So when you decide on equity, and while you can adjust the equity, it's really best practices not to. So nail it down, be definitive, um, and make sure that you're allocating the founder equity in a way that's commensurate with the founder's importance to the company, okay? And so think about it in this way. If you had to get up in front of a VC and explain to the VC um, partner why you allocated your, your equity in a certain way, the answer probably isn't, hey, there's four of us, so we just did 25% each. The answer is, uh, Sheree has been building out the back end of our product. If Sheree left, it would be devastating to the company. So therefore, we gave Sheree 45% of the company. You know, Naresh is building out the front end of the product, and that's critical. Um, and so he's getting, you know, 40% of the company. And obviously, I'm making these numbers up. But those are the types of things that you need to, to think about when you're allocating equity. And it also is helpful because in doing that, you'll define what people's roles are within the organization. And then the last thing is impose vesting. You don't want to be too aggressive with vesting or vesting acceleration. There's market um, for what vesting is. And what I mean by that is, again, going back to my VC example, there's certain vesting schedules that VCs are used to seeing. They think it's market and will basically um, um, you know, have concerns if you have vesting provisions that um, are not market or two founder favorable. All right, IP best practices. You should get IP assignments from all co-founders, collaborators, employees, consultants. Anybody who's involved in your project, you should get an IP assignment from them. It is critical because you wanna make sure that the company owns the IP that it um, purports to own, okay? And this is true in every startup company. Part of our startup package is having every founder sign an IP assignment. And then after that, every employee consultant will sign some type of IP assignment. You should also look at whether or not there's risks of claims by former employers. And so what I mean by that is if I'm working at, you know, a large company um, and I decide I'm going to leave and um, go start a company that may be competitive with my former employer, you need to assess the risk of, as to whether or not that former employer it could make a potential claim over IP that has been has been developed or will be developed by that particular individual. And so it's just a discussion. And this is part of the when when I take on a new company, assessing whether or not a particular founder may have an issue with a former employer or a current employer for that matter. I mean, a lot of our companies, you know, they're working, you know, the quote unquote day jobs and they're doing their startup company, you know, at nights and weekends. And especially, especially given the pandemic, you know, the blur between, you know, what's what you're doing during your quote unquote normal workday and what you're doing for your startup, whether it be nights and weekends, can often be blurred. Um, establish good policies um, to protect your IP. And what that means is not only get, do you get the IP assignments, but you use non-disclosure agreements. Again, you use IP assignments. You, if you have trade secrets, obviously you don't disclose the trade secrets. So just good practices um, uh, with respect to your um, IP protection. Um, open source requirements. I don't think I've had a client that has strictly complied with open source requirements, um, but you should, you should try because if, if, you're, if your particular software or whatever you're doing is largely dependent on open source and you're not complying with the various open source requirements, that can be a due diligence um, issue. And then the last thing is just keep track of filing deadlines. If you have um, provisional patents or you're doing a full utility patent, um, just make sure you're aware of what those deadlines are. Again, your counsel will be critical to make sure that you don't miss deadlines, um, but it, it is also something that, that everybody should be um, aware of and make sure that they're cognizant of when things need to be filed. So quick question, can you go back to the uh, previous slide, please, mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, ownership? Cap table, yes. Uh, if you can touch up on one topic about how, you know, 
important it is to think about investing and how people might leave, co-founders might leave, which is a very common case, um, because teams fall apart. And how do people deal with that at that point? Like talk, if you can give a color, the difficulties a founder might go through uh, and how uh, you help. Sure. So, so vesting is really important to make sure that the founder is engaged and will continue to be engaged with the company. Because using my example of four founders at 25% uh, each, you know, if that one founder leaves and they're not subject to vesting and they walk away with 25% of the company, that could make the company basically unfundable. Okay. And so you really want to impose vesting. What's normal vesting is four years monthly or four years with what's called a one-year cliff. And what that means is 25% best after one year and the remaining 75% best over the remaining 36 months. So you, you, by having vesting, you ensure that the, the founder, if they're going to leave um, the company, doesn't walk away with a large percentage ownership of the company. So I've, I've had companies that have come to me um, before I've represented them and you know, told me that they just issued the stock and didn't impose vesting on anybody, um, but this one founder left and he left with 30% of the company. Um, and we tried to do certain things, um, but basically what it, what it meant was we dissolved that company and we had to start a new company um, with adequate um, capitalization and vesting. Um, that's not always possible. You know, if you're working on a company and, you know, you're two or three years into it um, and the person leaves um, and they're not subject to vesting, you can't just start a new company. We were able to do it because the company was super early stage in my example. But the point is, is that this, again, comes down to you want to make sure that the company is protected, that the other founders are protected. And the way you do that is by from day one, you impose vesting and you get IP assignments. I've had situations where uh, a founder leaves, um, the company has never gotten an IP assignment from that particular founder. And the investor said, look, we'll, we'll invest, but before we do, you need to go get an IP assignment from this founder. This founder was fairly sophisticated and he basically said, I'm not gonna sign an IP assignment unless you give me seven, I think it was 7% of the company. Um, and you know, our client had to do that um, in order to get funded. If our client would have gotten that IP assignment, signed it up when that founder was, you know, fully engaged, um, you know, wouldn't have given up 7% of the company. So again, not to repeat myself, but it's very important to do things right from the get-go, because if you don't, there could be fairly drastic consequences. Uh, I have a question on the, the IP assignment. Is it a deed, the IP assignment? No, it's just a contract. It's a, what's usually referred to as proprietary information and inventions assignment agreement. What it effectively says is um, any IP that you develop that's related to the company and what the company's business is, um, it's the company's property. Okay, every single person um, on this on this Zoom who's gone to work for a company has signed an IP assignment with that company as part of your onboarding process. So you know it's 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 a normal customary thing, but no, it's not like a deed or a grant. It's just a contract at least in California. A um, couple of other just quick points. Um, develop an IP strategy. You know, think about what your strategy is um, from, from the get-go. You know, mo in most instances, it's not something that you need to file a patent for on day one, but you should at least think about it and have a conversation with your counsel about, you know, what is your IP strategy? You know, should we be um, doing a provisional patent? Should we do a utility patent? You know, what's our timing? What was the first time there was public disclosure of our idea? And that gets the clock ticking on when you can file a patent. All of those types of things are important and your counsel can, can help you with that. And similarly with trademarks, you know, have a conversation as to whether or not you do or should do a registered trademark. You do get some protection, you know, for what I refer to as common law trademark, but it may, may be worth it to register um, your trademark. It, it, is, it is extremely disruptive if your, your company and whatever product you're developed starts to get traction and, and your branding is very important to you, right? So you're out there selling your product, you're starting to get market share, you're feeling really good about your company, you're generating revenue, and then you find out that another company um, uh, uses the same mark or has the same name. And then you could potentially be forced to, um, to give up that name or have to change it. And that's in, that could be really, really disruptive from a branding perspective. 
All right, licensing matters. I won't go too much into this, but the takeaway is um, if you're, and most of you are, if not all, um, are affiliated, affiliated with the university, okay? And if you're developing IP in your lab, then, the, then as in most cases, the university owns that, that IP. So the normal thing to do in that situation is you go get a license from the patent, for the patent, right? But there's also, if you're doing things on your own time and you're not using university property, you're not using their facilities, and there's some other considerations that we should talk about, maybe the university does not own that property or that IP. And so it's just a conversation you should have with your counsel to one, you know, if you haven't really gotten started developing the IP, you know, what's your development plan? Do you need the university's um, resources labs? The answer to that is no, maybe you do it on your own time um, um, and not use their facilities. And that means it's your property. Or if it's, hey, we really do need to use the university's facilities and labs, um, or we've been working on this for a while, then we need to have discussion about going to the university and getting a license. Okay. Um, disclosure absent an NDA, kind of goes back to my previous point, may affect patentability of IP. Um, on the license front, royalty provisions are critical. Um, and then be flexible um, and focus on critical points when you're in licensing IP. In my experience, um, working with UC, University of California, working with other universities on licensing matters, they are very flexible um, when licensing their IP. Um, but you should focus on what is critical to you um, rather than you know, have your lawyers um, negotiating every line in the license. If that happens, you'll never get a license. Okay, so you really need to focus on what's important when you're licensing IP. HR, okay. Most companies, if they're on a pre-funded basis, they can't pay um, their, uh, the founders, okay. Um, and so what you typically do is make them contractors and you pay them an equity, right? Because you have to pay people in California minimum wage if they're employees. So you just need to think about that whether or not they're employees versus contractors. I'm sure some of you may be familiar with the, you know, the, the Uber cases regarding misclassification. Um, that's the issue there, whether you're classifying somebody as an independent contractor versus an employee. Um, again, get assignment of inventions and non-disclosure agreements. And then this is more incumbent on the founders than really the company. But I work with a, a lot of um, founders that you know, are in the US on some type of visa status. You need to make sure when you set up the company that you're not doing something that runs afoul of your visa status. So if you're on a visa, um, we would normally connect you with, um, we don't do immigration. That's the one area of law that my firm does not do, but I have folks that I outsource it to. How we would have a conversation with an immigration attorney to make sure what the way that we're setting up the company doesn't create issues with your visa status. And that, that's very important, obviously. All right, equity comp. And this is, this is a little bit separate from the founder stock that we talked about earlier. This is really um, compensation options that you would grant to um, employees, contractors, advisors, um, usually after you're kind of up and running. Okay, the founders get founder stock. After the founders get founder stock and you start hiring employees, contractors, and advisors, you usually give them an option, okay? So first of all, um, Investors counsel, buyers counsel look very carefully at this because it's somewhat fraught with potential tax and other issues. And so you really wanna make sure your counsel is involved if you're gonna be granting options to make sure it's done correctly. Um, so proper authorization, making sure you get board approval for every option grant. For what's called 409A compliance, that refers to an IRS section 409A. And it basically says, <clears throat> excuse me, if you issue an option that has a, um, uh, exercise price below fair market value, there is extreme adverse tax consequences for both the company and the option. It, it, in some ways, it, it kind of makes the option worthless. Um, so you really want to make sure that it's foreign IP compliant, state and foreign law compliant. Your counsel should handle all of that. Um, 83B elections. If you're issuing stock, even founder stock, um, you'll have to do what's called an 83B election. I won't get into the details on that, but it needs to be filed within 30 days of the date of issuance of the stock. And so again, your counsel will help you with that, but it's critical because I've had clients that come to me 
um, and they've done you know their their stock issuances through Clerky as an example, and uh, and they never filed an eighty three B election. And if you don't file an eighty three B election, what that means is you have to pay tax on the spread between what you purchase the stock at, which is basically zero for founders, and what the fair market value is of that stock on the date it vests. So think about a situation, you buy the stock today for zero and it's worth $2 a share, you know, a year and a half from now, you have to pay tax on that two bucks, but you have a liquid stock. You can't go out and sell the stock to pay that tax. So it's critical, critical you bought, you file the 83B election. Um, we talked about vesting, investing acceleration. Um, Milestone-based vesting provisions. I often get the question, you know, hey, we really want, you know, these, these options or the, or the founder stock to be vesting based on the achievement, achievement and milestone, you know, your, your, your MFN um, or, you know, some other milestone. Um, the problem with that and the reason I, in most cases, I tell my clients to not do that is because if the milestone is not kind of binary, meaning it's pretty easy to determine whether it's been achieved or not achieved, then it, it is fraught with potential dispute. I, I achieved the milestone. No, you company says, no, you didn't. Or I would have achieved the milestone had the company given me the appropriate resources to achieve the milestone. So subject to limited exceptions, my view is you should really try to avoid milestone-based vesting provisions and really make them time-based vesting, as I mentioned earlier. And then buyback procedures, basically when you issue stock, restricted stock, it's subject to vesting. But on day one, you own all of the stock. But if you leave before it's fully vested, then the company has to repurchase the unvested shares at the original price. So it's you know, usually it's 0 0.0001 cents per share. All right, financing best practices. And I'm not gonna really talk about um, financing from like a, a, a VC investor. This is more um, like, in the early stages, I have a lot of my companies that, that get um, financed through like angel investment um, and, and other potential investors. So one thing that I've seen is um, what's co commonly referred to as a fact finder. And that's somebody that will come to you and say, hey, I'll help you get, I'll help you get in, um, financed. And if, uh, if I do that, then you'll give me, you know, 3% of the proceeds as an example, um, if, if I bring in investors to you. Um, I find, in my experience, finders, frankly, rarely get a company um, financed. And um, if they're not registered broker dealers, then you could be running afoul of both federal and state securities laws. And if you do that, one of the remedies is the buyers of the, sh of the stock have a rescission right. So they could put the, the shares back to the company and get their money back. Um, so again, you know, if you come, if you came to me and said, hey, this guy came to me and said, you know, uh, I can help you get financed, we would look at it carefully, we'd have a discussion about it, and ultimately we would determine whether or not it's the right thing to do for the company. Um, voting percentages and veto rights, that just really comes down to who, control. Um, accredited investors only, accredited investors is a legal term, um, and, and you really should only have accredited investors um, investing in your company. Um, and then the last kind of things are, probably pretty obvious, but just making sure you have good contracts. And this goes back to my original point where investors, you know, look at things in a certain way and are used to seeing contracts in a certain way. And if you have ambiguous language or the, con the contract is unclear it, or it just looks weird um, and not something that the investors are used to, it's going to raise a red flag. So if you get counsel from the get-go, they'll make sure that the documentation that you have for, um, for the issuance of your equity it is buttoned up the way it should be and what the investors expect to see. All right, control considerations. This does apply to a VC financing situation. So whenever I'm representing a company and usually, you know, early, early stage companies, you know, the company is really the founders, okay? While we technically represent the company, the company is really the founders. And so whenever you are gonna get a, an equity investment, you know, you're gonna do your series C financing as an example, you're going to be giving up certain rights or control of the company, both, both on a you know, stock ownership level and then also on a contractual level. 
And so what we do is when you get a term sheet, um, we will walk that term sheet through with the founders and explain one, what's market, you know, this is a normal thing. Two, you know, whether or not it's market, um, you know, you're gonna give up certain control. As an example, there's protective provisions in uh, a series seed financing. And what those are are basically veto rights that the preferred stockholders have over certain fundamental transactions that involve the company, such as raising more money or, um, or selling the company. So th there are certain things that are quote unquote normal or market, and there's certain things that are not. And we can help you um, one, define what those are. And then two, with the things that we think are market or normal, we can explain to you how you're giving up certain control over your company. All right, this might seem a little bit um, uh, obvious, but, and I mentioned it earlier, but keep good records, follow, you know, co corporate formalities. If you're issuing options, as, as an example, have the board authorize those options. The board has to authorize the issuance of any securities of the company. Um, is stockholder approval required for certain actions? We would advise on that. Um, and then proper, you know, documentation of options and other equity issuances. I've, I've had clients that we give them the option plan and we give them the documentation associated with it. Um, and, you know, we've given uh, acceleration, vesting acceleration to one person, to an advisor. And the client went out and issued options using that same agreement to the three or four employees. You don't, you would not normally give vesting acceleration to employees, but he did it because he thought he was saving money and he, and he didn't realize that he was using an agreement that he used for a found for an advisor, which would normally have vesting acceleration. And he started using that for his employees. So the only takeaway from this is talk to your counsel and make sure that you document everything appropriately. All right, is, whoop, is anybody on an advisory board or an advisor to a company? Okay, um, so in my experience, um, when you engage an advisor, and by the way, they can be incredibly helpful and valuable to a company. Um, I have a lot of companies, I would say most of my companies have some type of advisor, um, whether the advisor is a, you know, kind of an industry, um, experience in their particular industry or an academic. Um, it, is, it is incredibly important um, to have the, the correct advisors. So you wanna make sure they have the relevant experience. I think that's pretty, you know, pretty obvious. Um, the second thing, it may seem kind of fundamental, but actually provide the required level of services. The biggest issue that I run in with advisors is they're too busy. You engage an advisor, the advisor is very excited to you know, start working with the company, but as you get into the advisor relationship, the advisor doesn't have the time, the bandwidth to actually provide the services that you need. So you really need to judge um, whether or not, and ask the questions, just ask them point blank. Do you have the time to provide um, you know, our advisor services? And also explain what your expectations are as well. And that can be in the, the advisor um, agreement as well. But hey, say, hey, we expect 10, 10, 10 hours a month or five hours a month or whatever it is, but get buy-in for that. So the both the advisor and you are clear as to what level of services he or she is gonna provide. Do not promise too much equity. For an advisor, the usually equity is 0.25% to 1% of the company. Usually 0.25 to a half a percent and it vests over two years monthly. That's market. Now, there may be outliers to that. So, you know, you have, you'll have the conversation with your counsel to see if a different um, percentage um, and or vesting schedule makes sense. But as a general matter, think about two and a half, I'm sorry, 0.25% to a half a percent um, vesting um, over two years. And then the last thing is properly document the advisor relationship. We have a simple advisor agreement that we give our clients it lays out, you know, how much time they're going to get. It lays out their equity comp, and it has a very simple IP assignment provision in there. Because presumably, the 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 advisor might be providing information to you that is related to your IP development. So you want to make sure you own that. Um, and again, it's just it's proper documentation that your counsel um, can can um, assist you with. All right, the exit event. The goal is to focus on the economics of the event. You know, what, what each individual stockholder is going to receive, 
um, things like that. Um, we that's more of a business point, but I often am involved in actually negotiating the economics of the event, or at least advising my clients as to what the economics are and what it means. Um, if there's earnouts, if you're getting shares rather than cash, if you're getting shares, what kind of shares are they? Are they are they um, liquid from day one, um, or are they restricted, um, where you would have to wait um, in order to get liquidity? Um, so all of those things we can advise on, um, and also you know, given the level of deals we do, we can discuss you know, hey, th this this buyer is willing to give us you know fifty million dollars for our company. You know, we can say, well, you know, we've represented a couple of other companies in your space, um, you know, have similar market share or revenue generation, and they've received sixty-five million dollars. And obviously, I'm making up these making up these figures, but it's it's a discussion we can have, and we can provide a little bit of market data and experience um, based on you know the deals that we've done. And the last thing is just be prepared and don't try to avoid having to negotiate from weakness. And what I, what the typical negotiate from weakness means is. You're running out of money and you're trying to sell your company and the buyer knows that you're running out of money and therefore they have a lot of leverage. If you're going to start a, 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 a sale process, it would be best to be properly capitalized to the extent you can because you can basically tell a buyer if they're not giving you the economics you want that you, know, you're, you, you, you have the ability to move on and not take their deal. So I went through this. Nobody had any questions. I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and if you have questions, let me know. Um, and then I'll also give you a short summary of our program for startup companies as well. But it looks like there's some people in the chat. Right. Thank you so much, Joe, for uh, the lovely talk. And um, so, yeah, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So I'll just go over that and then you guys, you can answer. Uh, yeah. Um, so the first question is... Uh, Right, from um, Jamie Moore, he says, how does the IP assess, uh, assignment work? So it, it is a contract that you'll enter into with the company that says that any IP that's related to the company's business is the company's property. And so what that means is, is all of the work that you do for the company, all the IP that you develop is the company's property. And everybody signs one of those, whether you're working for a startup or you're working for Apple or Google. So that, that's how it works. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Alexander has a question. It says, uh, how a founder share of uh, shares of capitalization relate to contribution of founders as co-investors of key IP behind the company? Um, so, so that goes back to my earlier point. So, okay, in 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 my experience dealing mostly with tech companies, I do have some companies that I represent that are not kind of traditional tech companies. But let's focus on tech companies because I think that's probably where you're all focused. Um. In my experience, what you should do is you need to sit down with all the founders and determine what people are going to contribute to the company. And what I mean by that is, has somebody, you know, has Shri gone off and, and developed or wrote a bunch of code that he's bringing to the company and, um, and you're going to build um, a company around that software code, as an example. You know, Shri's percentage ownership in the company should be higher than you know, mine if I were in-house counsel, as an example. You don't usually have an in-house counsel for a, an early stage startup, but, but just using that example, because if you look at it this way, if Shri left or didn't contribute his, counsel, his, his IP to the company, the company would basically be screwed, right? But if I left, you guys could go out and get another in-house counsel. I think I'm a pretty good lawyer, but let's be honest, you guys could go out and get a, a, um, a, a, a new in-house counsel. So, so those are the conversations you should have. Who's, de who's developing the key IP? Who's bringing the key IP? Who's working full-time versus part-time? Um, if you're all working part-time, you know, is one person going to be, you know, have two years to get done with their PhD and so they can't go full-time for two years? Is another person going to be, um, only have one year to finish their PhD? And so after one year, they can start full-time. All of those considerations um, go into the, um, the determination of what percentage ownership each founder should have. In my experience, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the people that are developing the IP are the most critical. Um, you know, there, you might have an early salesperson, you might have a business development person, but it's, it's really the folks that are developing the IP, in my experience, that 
you know, are most key to the company, just to be frank. Could I, could I elaborate this question? Uh, for example, the company is not formed yet formally, but invention is made and uh, uh, the founders or few founders is filing for patents. Uh, then the question of assignment arise, they, they would need to reassign the, uh, the pending application to the company with the form and uh, they the co-inventors. So should be uh, the contribution to, to uh, the inven invention be reflected in a uh, uh, co-ownership agreement? Because uh, every inventor have vested before they assign vested equal right uh, to license uh, and to do everything they want with the whole patent, even they contribute differently. So how it's formalized? So, so you're you're exactly right. So if you have inventors on a patent um, before you form a company, you basically want to form the company and assign that patent to the company. So the the company would be the owner of that patent, um, and the equity ownership split could very well um, take into account. Um, you know, one or two co-founders, whoever it is, or who the inventors are of the patent, it should probably take into account that you guys are the co-inventors on the patent and the, you're assigning the patent to the company. And that should be part of the mix of the discussions as to what percentage each person should get. It's a perfect example. Allow some additional questions. Uh, it may be a few key patents, but eventually one of the inventions get to the product. So the... Uh, the, the money stream will go only from one invention, not from others. And uh, um, it may be not the same uh, share in the initial uh, ownership, then uh, it go to market. So how it could be resolved that in initially they split for equal uh, ownership, but uh, something what would be monetized essentially from invention from one person. Uh, you could issue that person additional shares in the company to bump up their percentage ownership as compared to the other founders. Okay. So in other words, rather than pay that inventor or the, the assignee in cash, you would give them an extra X percent of the company in return for assigning that patent to the company. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, in the event of like the exit event, uh, what are some of the things that you can offer the investor? Yeah, what are some of the things that you can offer? Uh, in, in an exit event, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, um, let's say you're pitching your idea to an investor and then we get to the exit event. Um, what are some of the things that like the business offers to them? Well, an exit event, is either a sale of the company or an IPO typically. Okay. So you're selling the company at that point. If you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, what, what you're doing um, in, a, in a financing for the investor, I mean, if that's, is that the question? Yeah. Like if their investment doesn't work in the company, what do we offer them in return? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay. So you're talking about a situation where an investor is invested in the company for whatever reason, the company is no longer able to continue and you're basically going to wind it down. Yes. So there's a there's enough. We could probably have an hour and a half discussion on that one point alone. Um, but as a at a very very high level, um, usually investors when they invest, they're investing in preferred stock, and so they have a liquidation preference over the holders of common common stock, and the holders of common stock are the founders. So what if they, it's not stock? Like what if it's I kind of lost my train of thought, but what if they're not investing in stock? So they're investing in like a like a safe? Yeah. So if they're investing in a safe, they still have a liquidity preference over the holders of the stock on a contractual basis, but it would really depend on how and if they can monetize the IP. So they, they have a preference over the holders of the founder stock, but it kind of comes down to how they could potentially monetize the IP do they need to negotiate with other safe investors? Um, you know, if, if this is a larger company, um, you know, there's the, something called um, um, an assignment for benefit of creditors, common, commonly referred to as an ABC process, where a third party goes out and tries to market the IP and sell it. And then 
um, the company gets the proceeds and then the, 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 the uh, safe investors would at least get part of their money back. So there's a lot of different alternatives mm. based on the facts and circumstances of the particular situation. Okay, that helps me. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Uh, then uh, Jamie has another question. Uh, could you explain the difference between uh, utility versus provisional patent? Sure, I'm going to do it at a high level because I'm a corporate lawyer and not a not an IP guy. Um, but basically, a provisional patent is something that you would file that has certain claims in it, but it's not as and this is probably not the way, right way to explain it, but not as detailed as a, a utility patent. And the reason people file a provisional patent is because you don't need that detail. And frankly, it's much cheaper to do a provisional patent because you, you don't have as many claims, you don't have as much detail and you're able to file it. And the, and the, the um, benefit of doing a provisional patent is one, it's cheaper, at least initially. Two, it gives you time to figure out whether or not you want to do a full utility patent. And three, if you decide you want to do a full utility patent, and a utility patent is something that lays out all the claims in, in um, excruciating detail. Um, but if you decide to do the utility patent, then the utility patent gets the benefit of the date you file the provisional patent. You have to file the utility patent within 12 months of filing the provisional patent. So if you file, as an example, a provisional patent on January 1st, 2021, you have till January 1st, 2022 to do the full utility patent. And if any patents are filed in that one year period that are similar to yours or maybe infringing on yours, you get the benefit of that earlier filing date for purposes of your utility patent. But from a practical perspective, the provisional patents are cheaper and you can get them on file quickly and you don't need as much detail. And are, are those kind of uh, patents already good enough for you to convince uh, your investors that you really have something that? Often they are. Um, but the, the key in a provisional patent is like, you, I could take this, this my presentation, this is probably a dumb example, but I could take my presentation, put a provisional patent cover page on it and file it. But the key with a provisional patent is you need to have enough detail in that provisional patent that the claims in the utility patent can relate back to the provisional patent. So in other words, if you're making a bunch of new claims in your, in your utility patent that are not reflected in your provisional patent, you're not gonna get the benefit of that earlier filing date. Um, but to your point is if investors, if you do a provisional patent and, and we can do them or you can get a patent boutique and make sure it has enough detail in it, yeah, investors put a lot um, uh, of uh, value in that, absolutely. All right, uh, Adam, what yeah. is the soonest licensing can occur in the patent process? Um, that is a question I need to defer to my um, my IP guys on, I apologize. I think you can do, a, a, well, I'm not sure if you can actually license a provisional patent. Um, I'm not sure if you can get, a, you, the patent actually has to be issued in order to, to do a license. I don't think it does. I think you can get a license to a provisional patent. And I also think you can get a license to a patent um, a, a utility patent that hasn't actually been issued yet. Um, but I do think there's some detail there um, that I would need to get my uh, IP guys to weigh in on. I don't want to mislead anybody. Um, we have a recording on, on our YouTube channel, on BPEP YouTube channel, uh, on the IP issues. So uh, please refer to that. I'll try and paste it in the chat. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Next yeah. question. Would you recommend recording board meetings? Absolutely not. Do, do not audio record board meetings. Um, and the reason for that is, well, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is um, you want your board of directors to be frank and honest in board meetings. Um, and if you record them, you can often find yourself in a situation where people are apprehensive and won't be frank and honest. So that's a practical consideration. The legal consideration is, well, there's a few. Um, one, when you get due diligence, when an investor looks at your, your minutes and of your meetings or your board consents, they're gonna review those for, for content. I am, I am intentionally somewhat general when I'm taking the minutes of a meeting. So we do have board minutes of a meeting. We have a written record of the meeting, but I, don't, I would not recommend recording it because that, those recordings will ultimately get reviewed by, um, by people that are diligencing uh, the company. And there may be things said in a board meeting that you wouldn't want an investor to hear. Um, 
The second thing is, is that if you're ever involved in litigation, um, in many instances, um, in the course of discovery, um, minutes of board meetings and things like that are discoverable. So you don't want um, conversations um, necessarily to be discoverable um, in, uh, in a litigation situation. All right, going to the next one. Um, could you go over a, a sample term sheet? Um, I, I, I do a whole presentation on term sheets, so I don't think we really have the time tonight. Um, but if you have questions on a particular term sheet, you can feel free to send it to me, um, or I'd be happy to do another talk and we can go through a term sheet. Um, I, I typically um, have done uh, uh, presentations where I have myself and one of my colleagues and he represents the investor um, and I represent the company or vice versa. And we go through a term sheet and kind of highlight um, things that are would be um, uh, of concern to a company. Um, it's kind of a mock negotiation. So I'd be happy to do that if anybody's interested, but um, going over a term sheet tonight, I, I don't think we have time to do that. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a question from students. It says, uh, it talks about uh, current visa and uh, what J1 visa. So again, I don't want to punt on this, but I am not an immigration attorney. Right. Um, and so it's not really something that I can uh, can advise on. Yeah, uh, I would advise him to uh, like students to just go, go through this. Uh, Naresh has actually posted a, a recording of the IP workshop, but we have other legal uh, you know, workshops on legal uh, uh, aspects as well about immigration as well as IP. So feel free to go to our, our BPAP YouTube channel and you'll get a lot of info on that. Yeah. So you should do that. You should also, um, Berkeley has uh, immigration resources where they can give you some advice on that. And if you need um, a referral to a, an actual attorney, um, I can do that as well, if that would be helpful. Perfect. Thank you. And Alexander has another question, um, Joe. It's, it's, yeah. um, so the, the question is, what's the difference of working with angel investors versus venture capitals, if, if, if any? It, it's more of a business point. Angel investors are usually very early in investors and they don't invest um, uh, or they don't make as large investments as venture capitalists. So using kind of a, a general example, you know, if you're doing a safe financing or series C financing, you likely will have angel invest or you may have angel investors involved. Whereas if you're doing, you know, series C, series A, series B, it's really um, more of a venture capital um, investor situation. Um, again, I'm being very general here just at the, uh, due to time, but um, that, that's, that's generally it. And then when you're working with an, um, angel investors, it, you know, it's kind of incumbent on you to, you know, the same way, frankly, you do with venture capitalists, do a little research, maybe talk to some people that they've um, invested in, um, just to make sure that you're comfortable having them be an investor in your company. So if everybody has five more minutes, I can give you a quick summary of our program for startup companies, if that's of interest. Yes, um, and then if there's any other questions that we didn't get to tonight, um, my email's up there right now. Again, Shri and Naresh have it. Yep. You can feel free to, uh, to reach out to me. So for, for startup companies that qualify, and if you're affiliated with UC Berkeley, you'll qualify. Um, we have what's called our quick launch program. And it basically has three components. The first component is um, formation of the company. And that's not only actually forming the company, it's um, assisting with issuing founder stock. If you're going to adopt a stock option plan, doing the, the IP assignments, um, basically everything to kind of get up and running. We also provide um, forms like form NDAs and things like that. We actually do that for free other than third-party filing fees, which run about $500. Um, the state of Delaware has a filing fee to file your certificate of incorporation as an example. Um, the second bucket or component is, um, is we give a 20% discount on our standard rates for work that's outside of the formation. So if you're in licensing, out licensing technology, if you need a terms of use, if you need a privacy policy, if you, um, you know, are hiring employees, you want us to handle the offer letters, um, basically everything over and above um, what's in the free component, we give a 20% discount on our fees. And lastly, and most importantly, any fees that you incur, we defer until you raise at least $500,000 in funding, okay? So it allows you to work with us. We defer all fees. <clears throat> if for whatever reason you don't get funded, we would write off those fees. You're never, the founders are never personally liable for those fees. Technically the company is our client 
And if the client do doesn't get funded, then obviously they don't have the money to pay us. Um, and we would write off those fees. Um, most of my clients between inception and doing the, their first priced round of financing, series seed, um, usually incur about twenty to thirty thousand dollars in fees. Some a little bit more, some a little bit less. More usually um, is contingent on if you're going to in license a patent from from UC Berkeley. The fees are going to be more because that that'll cost probably fifteen thousand dollars in and of itself. So um, if anybody has any questions or wants more information about our quick launch program, um, I'm happy to send it to them. I think one of my colleagues might be. Um, on, on this chat as well, um, but we can we can send it to you and be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Sure. So really appreciate you guys inviting me tonight. Um, again, you know, feel free to reach out to me. The reason I do what I do is basically to work with entrepreneurs. And even if it's a one-off question um, you, or you're not ready to start your company now, I'd be happy to give you, you know, an answer to your question to the extent I can. Um, and if I can, I, you know, try to point you in the right direction. Thank you so much, Joe Ayak, for uh, joining us and for your time. Yeah. Happy to do it. And hope hope everybody's doing well, and uh, hopefully we can uh, start doing these uh, in person at UC Berkeley pretty yeah, soon. Looking forward to it, yes. Oh, definitely. Hey, Joe, thanks. Sacha is online. Sacha, thank you so much for catalyzing everything. Appreciate it, guys. Everybody have a good night. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So,